Okay, we have actually reached the final panel of the day. Election day is less than 30 days away and we are actually in, at the home stretch now. Yes. Some say an ocean of time. <laughs> now we have our moderator, Julia Manchester. Thank you. Uh, Thank Julia you. is from uh, a reporter for The Hill. <laughs> And she will be moderating this timely panel with well-known political pundits. So, Julia, take it away. Thank you so much, Johan, and thank you so much to the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce for having us today. I'll introduce our panelists to my right. I have Matt Gorman. He is the vice president or a, a vice president and Republicans at the Republican strategist, strategist firm Targeted Victory. He previously served as communications director for the National Republican Congressional Campaign Committee. And before that, he was rapid response director and national spokesperson for former governor, uh, Florida Governor Jeb Bush's 2016 presidential campaign. Now I have Doug High. He's the senior vice president of media at Kraft Media. He's a veteran Republican of politics serving on Capitol Hill for former House Majority Lead Leader Eric Cantor and he was communications director for the Republican National Committee. He's also a CNN political commentator. And to my left I have Karen Tremontano. She is the co-founder and chief executive officer at Blue Star Strategies. Karen served as deputy chief of staff to former President Bill Clinton from 1997 to 2011 and later served as chief of staff for the former president's transition team establishing his presence in New York City. And finally, we have Antoine Seawright. He is the founder and CEO of Blueprint Strategies based in South Carolina. He's also a CBS News political contributor. He advised the 2008 and 2016 presidential campaigns for Hillary Clinton, as well as the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, the South Carolina Democratic Party, and the South Carolina State Democratic um, Caucus. Thank you all for being here with me today. I really appreciate it. So we're 33 days out from Election Day, and we are coming off the heels of a very contentious and what a lot of critics have described as an atrocious debate. You know, I want to start with you, Antoine. You know, what's the state of the campaign right now from the presidential ballot to the House races? Well, we're 33 days away from what I would describe as the most consequential election of our lifetime, and you oftentimes hear Democrats say that, but now the Republicans are rehearsing our talking points in their daily lingo. Uh, I think the state of the campaign is probably up for grabs. Uh, I have political PTSD from 2016 mm. when everyone predicted a victory uh, for Hillary Clinton and this magical blue wave that will happen. I think the stakes are higher than ever, uh, and they're higher than they've ever been before, but I think people are paying attention now than, they, than they've ever been before. That debate, uh, Tuesday night was a pure display of what is at stake on the ballot, but what the next four, 10 to possibly 20 years of this country will look like. And so if you're looking for a direct answer about what's going to happen in November, I can't tell you. What I do know is whoever wins in November will be able to adjust the tone and temperature of this country for three or, th three or four generations. Absolutely. And Karen, on that note, Joe Biden is leading in a number of national polls and a number of swing states. But we know that Hillary Clinton also led you know, around this point and four years ago. What do Biden and the Democrats need to do at this point to avoid the same mistakes that the Clinton campaign made? Well, I think um, they need to stay on message and keep doing what they're doing. Um, I, I I think what is on the ballot uh, are issues that are very important to the American people. Uh, probably first among them uh, is uh, their health care, uh, the COVID situation in response to it, as well as the economy. Uh, you know, looking back at 2016, and I, I share my colleague, PSTD, <laughs> I was in Iowa at the time, mm. you know, there was a confluence of uh, of things that happen, uh, not the least of which was, uh, uh, you know, the Comey letter, uh, Russian interference, uh, low turnout. And I, I think a number of those things were not mistakes, but they were external events that, that happen. Um, so I, I think uh, the, the Biden campaign is well aware of what they need to do, and you see them in all of the key key states and um, 
you know, I think they're just going to keep steady on uh, what they're doing because what they're doing is uh, is producing results for them right now. Absolutely. And to my Republican friends, you know, President Trump is not leading in a number of swing states. He is behind in a number of national polls. And I think there's a concern that this could trickle down ballot, impacting a lot of Republicans who are trying to protect the Senate and regain a majority in the House. Matt, to you first, what do Republicans do right now at this point? Uh, that's a very good question. And it's hard to say because I think this race, at least the top level, has been remarkably stable. Same like the Democratic primary. As you, as you pointed out, Joe Biden's been up. I would say six to 10 points for much of the summer and now into the fall. And so I think what you need to do is you need to really establish your own identity state by state. But here's the trick. You can't do it in 33 days. You can't even do it in six months. You need to do it over the course of years. And so you need to be preparing for this moment for a very long time before that. You can't uh, do it uh, very late in the game. You have to practice for a, a year or two beforehand establishing your own brand in these districts. Um, you look at Susan Collins up in Maine. She's in a tight race, but the only reason it's even tight is because she spent decades uh, establishing an independent brand. Yeah. You know, and you look at other places across the ballot where, you know, in Antoine's home state of South Carolina, Lindsey Graham has really tied himself to Trump. So you look at some of the latest polling, they're mirroring a lot of the polls between Trump and Lindsey Graham. But the polls I've seen for the most part, you're, those Senate candidates are within a point or two of Trump in most states, Colorado and Maine yeah. not included. Right, right. And Doug, um, you know, on the national level, with some of President Trump's rhetoric, I mean, last Tuesday night, he declined to outright, um, you know, go, you know, put down the issue of mm -hmm. white supremacy. He just stepped away from the issue. You know, what does he need to do right now? Because he seems to have his own messaging, his own plan. He's his own communications director for all <laughs> intents and purposes. Well, I think there's a difference sometimes between what Donald Trump needs to do and what he's going to do. Yeah. And that's what we've seen in the debate and yeah. in the days following the debate. You know, Donald Trump is more beholden to his base than perhaps any politician that we've ever seen. It's mm -hmm. why he's never cut the deal on immigration that I think he could have that a Jeb Bush or a Marco Rubio wouldn't have been yeah. allowed to or on guns or, or issues like that. Then down ballot, that causes a lot of problems for Republicans who constantly can't define their own campaign and their own messaging because they're responding to the latest outrage du jour created by Trump. And so we're seeing that in, with governors, we're seeing it with senators, we're seeing it with House members. And meanwhile, there's another structural advantage that um, that that Biden has, at least you know thus far, and why he's leading is that his name's not Hillary Clinton. Now, yeah. I'm, I'm from North Carolina, and I remember being in North Carolina in the weeks before. Uh, the election and hearing several times, I'm going to vote for Trump because I don't like Hillary, but I wish Joe were running. My last yeah. conversation with my father before the elections, he said that exact mm -hmm. same thing to me, to me that other people did. It's one of the reasons that Biden has this advantage. A lot of people are very intense about Donald Trump one way or another. Joe Biden doesn't have that same kind of intensity because people tend to just like him. Yeah. That sure helps. Right. And on that point to you both, you know, I've talked to a lot of progressives that are very skeptical of Joe Biden. And even, you know, I know we're talking to an international audience right now. I have a lot of friends and colleagues in the UK. And the feedback I was getting from Tuesday night's debate was, is this the best you have right now? So how do you Democrats combat that message? Well, well I think it's plain and simple. Uh, we had a very intense primary yeah. and Biden came out on top. The truth of the matter is no matter the differences we may have amongst each other, they do not compare to the differences we have with the other side. And I think whether you like Biden or whether you're in love with Biden, the truth of the matter is you may not marry him this election cycle, but you're <laughs> going to be willing to date him because the stakes <laughs> are so high. And when you look up under the hood from a quality of life perspective, because I think that is the political North Star that would define this election, and you compare the two for Democrats, whether you're progressive, blue dog, yellow dog, pink dog, wherever you find yourself in the Democratic circle, you will clearly say, I have to vote for Biden because here's what people have figured out. You cannot govern if you do not win or the old Bill Clinton line, losers do not legislate. Mm -hmm. And so we can have all of the ideas about what these issues come down to, but if we're not winning, if we do not control the power switch, it really doesn't matter. And so I think you'll see um, Biden become the political glue that will not only bring this country together, but also bring together independent thinkers, moderate Republicans, and even, uh, believe it or not, Democrats who may not have been on the Biden train before now. Right. And Karen, you worked for Bill Clinton, and Bill Clinton was an amazing campaigner. You know, but it seems that Joe Biden's got a lot, gotten a lot of criticism for not maybe being as good of a campaigner as a Bill Clinton or Barack Obama. On top of that, 
he hasn't been doing as much many in-person events. It seems to be, for the most part, virtual. Do you think this is an obstacle for him? No, I, I don't think it's an obstacle. Um, I think what he's showing the American people is that he's being very cognizant about the situation that we're in, and he's not willing to put people's lives at risk to, you know, have some uh, rally or, yeah. uh, you know, event. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, look, what we're, we're, we're seeing is a very, um, a very different situation that, that uh, the two uh, candidates are, are managing quite differently. Um, but, you know, Joe Biden's been ahead in the polls consistently, so I don't think he's suffering by not having, you know, these rallies, um, you know, and as I said, putting people's lives at, yeah. at risk. Um, and I, I think the party has come together, um, and, you know, we have a, uh, we have a common, uh, we have a common opponent, mm -hmm. and so people are really pulling together, and I think uh, because, precisely because of Joe Biden's likability, uh, we used to have this uh, saying, uh, you know, President Clinton said it, uh, you know, Democrats like to fall in love. Mm -hmm. um, Republicans fall and in repo line. Republicans <laughs> fall in line. I was going to save that one. But, um, and I think this year we're, we're fine with dating. Right. Know? Absolutely. And, uh, I, yeah, I think it's, I think it's um, in everybody's uh, interest. We've finally figured that out. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk about the Supreme Court, obviously a very big issue for Republicans and an <coughs> issue that President Trump really has kept his promise on, not only at the Supreme Court level, but lower courts across the country. But I want to pose this to both of you. Why have Republicans flipped the switch four years later? Why do we need to have this vote? I mean, before election day, I mean, I would assume it's because there might be a fear of a risk of losing the Senate, the presidency, you know, I'll pose it to either of you. Yeah, look, politics is the art of the possible. You do what mm -hmm. you can when you can. And the rules sometimes change in your favor, whether your <laughs> opponent likes that or doesn't like it. A quick anecdote on that. I was with a reporter from the Washington Post the day that Antonin Scalia died, and he said, we're, a bunch of us were at a beach house. He said, I have to disappear, I've got to work. He comes back 30 minutes later and says, they're not gonna have a vote. And I said, well, that's great. What are they gonna do in a month when they inevitably have to cave? And the reality was yeah. it was a much more important issue for Republicans than it was for Democrats. And that's why Mitch McConnell was able to do what he, what he was able to do. So now the script is flipped, which means they're going to do the exact opposite. <clears throat> is it hypocritical? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is it effective? Yes. And for Republicans, this is a driving issue to them. And looking at you know, the, the election possibilities right now, tomorrow is not guaranteed to you. And you could lose Republican senators if we have a very bad election the day, you know, the day after, two days after, whenever that vote might be, you got to move now if you're going to move at all. Right, right. And Matt, on that point, um, you know, if the vote happens, assuming it happens before the election, how does, I've seen some commentary about, you know, whether this impacts Republican turnout or not. So if the vote happens before, I mean, are Republicans going to want to turn out to reward Trump in that instance? Does it have any impact on turnout? You know, it could. I, I think, again, going to Doug's point, for decades, I think, Demo or excuse me, Republicans have always drawn a very clear line between voting for Republican senators and a Republican president and appointing conservative judges. It's always been very clear. Democrats have really not uh, done that yet. Maybe yeah. it's this time, maybe not. And I think to your point, oh, let's be very clear, I think if that vote happens and Merrick Garland's in the Supreme Court, I don't think Trump wins that election because I can tell you how many people held their nose over the issue of Republican judges through a Republican president. And so maybe that is the case. However, the fact that uh, remaking the Supreme Court in essentially a 6-3, at worst, 5-4 favor among conservatives, it might give a little more license to Republicans to either be like, you know what, mission accomplished, or, you know, kind of wait until next time. Yeah, yep. And what do Democrats do in this scenario? I mean, it seems like there's not much you can do in the Senate. Republicans have the Senate right now. How does Biden message on this? Well, I think his, I think his messaging has been... Uh, pretty effective right now because he's educating uh, voters as to what's, what is on the ballot. Um, it's health care, it's Roe v. Wade, it's presidential power. It could be the results uh, of, of this election if they're contested. And I think that's energizing people. Um, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right in your assessment about where Democrats have been. 
um, with regard to, to judges, I think that day is over. Um, I think it's crystal clear. And it's also crystal clear what the exercise of power really means and the consequences of, of that. So, um, you know, technically, can the Democrats do anything? They might be able to push it and delay it a, a little bit. Um, but I think once the election happens uh, and people uh, people's voices are loud and clear. I think that's the table's going to be reset on that and how that is managed. You know, it was like three million plus votes in 2016 uh, that were um, where Hillary uh, received that Trump did not. And if there is a huge um, turnout and that number, that gap is even wider. You know, where does that put the credibility of the Supreme Court? And that's something the court's going to have to reckon with. Right. You know, <clears throat> the vice president and his campaign team, I've said this to his top lieutenants, they have to stay focused on health care. Uh, keep in mind, we're still living through the worst health pandemic since 1918 that has caused mm -hmm. some of the worst economic times perhaps since 1932. If you ask the average voter, not inside the Democratic or the Republican bubble. They're focused on COVID-19 and how their life has been rearranged, or as we say in yoga, how they've had to make adjustments. <laughs> and truth be told, the court is not on the top of their minds. And this election will come down to expectations, not about those of us in the DC bubble, but about everyday people who are just trying to figure out how to make the day and the night meet together. And so Biden has to stay focused on health care. That is the number one issue that will define this election. Democrats and Republicans agree on that. But I think this court battle, so to speak, will have a push and pull effect, pull effect for Democrats. It's going to pull us in about the reality of what McConnell and Republicans are willing to do when they have power and teach us the lesson. But also I think it's going to push out turnout from the base perspective, and it's going to push people to give money to candidates down the ballot because they figured out their net worth of their vote and how the Democratic network will play out in any given election. And that's why when you hear people say this election is about life or death or this election is consequential or generational, you can point to the courts because mm -hmm. whomever the next president will be will not just appoint to perhaps the upper courts, but they will have several appointments to the lower courts. Yeah. Those will be there for a lifetime. Uh, they will be confirmed by the Senate. And so I think people are figuring out what all it means about having this idea of being in control. Right, right. And I want to talk about coronavirus, obviously the big elephant in the room, if you will. Um, you know, it seems that Republicans have been campaigning quite a bit on economic recovery, which has, you know, in, in general, the party's very good at about campaigning on the economy. Democrats are more public health and the health aspect of it. Democrats also very good at campaigning on that aspect. You know, these are two factors that Americans are very concerned about, equally concerned about in many cases. Which side is stronger? Or can you even pit those two sides against each other? I think that's the tough part because is your, to your point, Republicans want to talk about the economy. They want to downplay a lot mm -hmm. with health care. I think Democrats are the opposite. They don't want to talk about reopening, but they do want to talk about health care. The truth is in the middle. Because the response to COVID is not purely a healthcare one, because as we're seeing, the economic impact is so massive. And it's only going to get worse, frankly, as we get into the winter and that outdoor dining or, yeah. you know, it's going to be very, very different as we experience as the summer. And so I think the tough part is both sides want to kind of win that tug of war, but they're going to have to answer for the other side. They're going to have to talk about the, what the, they don't really want to talk about because, quite frankly, this COVID response, it's economic and it's also healthcare. Right, right. And Doug? Yeah, and and look, you. you know, so much of the conversation about COVID has been really big city focused, New mm -hmm. York being the, the obvious example. We'll go to any college town in America right now, and obviously a lot of college towns are in swing states. Ann Arbor, Wisconsin, yeah. right. South Carolina, yeah. North Carolina. Yeah. Um, these towns are being decimated because the students haven't come back which means they're not going to Target. They're not going to the restaurants and bars, or if they are, we know what happens with COVID rates then. They're not going to a, a lot of the places spending the money that they would. The professors haven't necessarily come back. So these towns of not 2 million to 5 million people or larger, which are having very real problems, but 250,000 people towns that, are, that can plan for a summer off basically because they know come Labor Day, mm -hmm. there's gonna be an influx of 25,000 people. When that's not happening, that's having a real impact in swing states, and I don't think that gets the attention it deserves from Democrats or Republicans. Right, right. And, oh, Antoine. Well, well <clears throat> uh, keep in mind that 
uh, health care and the economy can go together. Yeah. What Republicans have tried to do is ignore the reality of their failure in the response to this pandemic and how it has had impact on the economy. So they want to talk about pre and after, but they forget about where we still are. And when you talk about health care, it has been Republicans who's failed on the issue of health care, according to the American people. That's why we won in the midterms. And when you talk about swing states, you think about the number of states where accessibility and affordability mm -hmm. when it comes to health care is the main driving yeah. force. And people, the nearest hospital is one hour away. And they have to take off work, work on an hourly job, mm -hmm. by the way, who are trying to figure out how to make those ends meet and then go to visit a healthcare facility one hour away. All that stuff has impact on people's everyday quality of life, which is why I've said to Biden's top lieutenants, you just have to stay focused not on the DC and the social media bubble, but think about yeah. everyday people's quality of life, particularly in the other America, the America that's not on social media, the America that doesn't always make the nightly news, the other America that really exists, the other America that decided the 2016 election. Right, right, and Karen, well, you know, I think where, the, where we make a mistake is we look at this as a binary choice, yeah. and it's not. I mean, it's, it's sequential, right? Mm -hmm. People, they want to engage in the economy. Everybody wants to be back, at, back to work, but you, you need to feel safe about it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I mean, the president has made a number of mistakes. I think chief among them has been not being able to feel safe and trust what is being said. All of our um, institutional messages, everybody's now questioning. And had the approach been, let's get everybody settled down to trust where we are and then come back and engage, uh, engage in the economy, I think we would have had a very you know, different um, result. And so I, and I, I believe Vice President uh, Biden in the campaign is thinking about this and certainly messaging in a sequential way and not a binary, and not a binary, it's not a binary choice at all. Right, right. I've noticed one, I guess, similarity between this campaign and the 2018 campaign. You know, Democrats laser focused on health care, obviously it helps them win back the House, many other seats. But then, similar to how President Trump, he talked about the caravan and immigration in 2018 when he was campaigning for a lot of these candidates, he's used this mes message of law and order in this kind of fear, many would say it's fear-mongering. Do you two think that's going to help him with, in particular, suburban women voters that are seen as very critical swing votes? I think it may be his least bad option. Uh -huh. um, you know, you don't hear a lot about the wall anymore. You don't hear about caravans and, and all those other things. The world has changed um, in, in just the past few months, uh, much less the past few years. There is certainly an appetite for Republican base voters that they want stuff knocked off in the streets. They don't want any buildings burned. And they'll give up any president, including this one, a longer leash than they might otherwise would to, to get violence quelled. There's certainly a backlash that comes with that, especially if you're Donald Trump, where you can often add fuel to that fire. Right, right. Matt, I mean, I know you work with a lot of down ballot candidates. Yeah. Um, how does this impact them? Well, it's a seesaw effect, right? Because when you you play in one aspect, it does affect another. So I'll, I, I know for a fact from folks I've talked to and seeing their polling that in the Rust Belt, the Midwest, that law and order message with the riots was extremely effective. But it didn't affect anything in the suburbs like uh, around Atlanta, Georgia yeah. or Phoenix, Arizona. However, speaking for the caravan, right, that was a little more troublesome because I can tell you firsthand, in, in districts and races about two weeks out in 2018 that we had a decent lead and I would say mid to high single digits max of about 10 points when the caravan became the dominant issue especially in Latino or um, suburban districts those are evaporated overnight and yeah. we, we lost a couple of those races and in one in western Texas we won very by a very slim margin these are races that both sides wrote off essentially. So you can have that message, and I agree with Doug, it's the least bad option, even though we're in the middle of a pandemic that most people tend to care about, but um, you, you, there's always a countervailing force. Right. I, I probably have a different perspective. Uh, I think when you hear the president use words like law and order, just as he did with immigration and the wall and others, I think it's coded. Uh, I think it's right wing toned down rhetoric that will feed the hearts and minds of a certain group of people in this country who he feels like he has to hold on to in order to be successful. Donald Trump, the one thing about his career and his presidency and his candidacy, he's flourished on anger, confusion, frustration. 
That's what that language means for me. And the truth of the matter is, I think when he uses the words law and order, he's trying to speak to a certain group of people and within his base, he has to hold together. But I think it's having a different effect because as you said, Doug, the temperature has changed as if it was eight, eight, 10 months ago. And now people are being able to see through the fog. They know what it means. And the truth of the matter is, I'm so thankful Biden has been good about denouncing all the things that Trump is trying to tie his hands with when it comes to his law and order message. Mm -hmm. We only have a few minutes left and we started talking about the debate the other night, but next week we have another debate, the vice presidential debate, you know, two, you know, debaters, Senator Harris and Vice President Pence, who are both skilled orders, sk skilled debaters. You know, I'll start with you two. You know, what does Harris need to do to, you know, come out on top? Well, I think, um, one of the things that I think she needs to do is to get m much clearer on the policies, health care, economic policy. There wasn't a lot of room for obvious reasons for Vice President Biden to clearly articulate, um, you know, what he would do, what a Biden-Harris administration would do with re regard to specific policies. And I know just from talking to people, they wanted to hear more. And I think Harris has to be uh, pretty clear on what their agenda it is, it is and how they're gonna move forward on that agenda. That right. Debates are a game of expectations, right? And I think she has to go into this knowing that it's not about what will get retweets and likes uh, or what will be the discussion on the nightly news, but it'll be about the long term and how it fits to the long term puzzle. And the truth of the matter is Kamala Harris, the first time a black woman will be on the debate stage for any major party mm -hmm. as their nominee, will just have to know that she belongs there and speak to the issues. We know she's a hell of a lawyer. We know she's a heck of a uh, debater. We've seen that play out. We also know that she brings something to the table with her experiences that Mike Pence and Donald Trump will never be able to speak to. And so if debates are just to cut even, if not anything else, she needs to be able to remind the base of the Democratic Party and independent thinkers and women that they will have a place and a say-so and their issues matter. And I think if she does that, everything else will fall into place. Right. And for Vice President Pence, I mean, I remember four years ago when he went up against Tim Kaine, he was very calm, cool, and collected compared to Tim Kaine. And many say he won that debate. You know, what does he need to do tonight yeah, look, or I think, tomorrow? Uh, yeah, I think what he needs to do is be as unmemorable as possible. And mm -hmm. that he tends to just kind of, as you said, be very steady and really not make a ton of news. I think the second part he needs to do is he needs to knock Kamala a little bit off her game. She's a very unsteady debater. When she can slice and dice and be prepared, as we saw in that very first debate when she went after Biden on busing, she's extremely effective. But as we saw when she became the front runner or close to it and started taking arrows on, on her own health care plan, how unclear she was, or even the other night when she had a very just incomprehensible word salad on the Supreme Court packing, she is very unsteady. And that becomes very clear. So I think what you need to do is twofold. Can he make no news himself, but get Kamala a little bit off her game so that the news coming out of it is her unsteadiness? Right. Yeah, I'd agree on the, on the question of court packing, but ultimately this is going to be much less contentious, thank God, but also a less, much less consequential debate. It's the vice presidential debate when you've got um, the most polarizing president in our nation's history and a, and a country that's really at, at, at odds with each other. The vice, president, the, price, excuse me, the vice presidential debate will be super interesting, but at the end of the day, no one will care. Right, right. Well, thank you so much to my panel for thank joining you. us. This has thank been a great conversation, and I hope um, we can all have more conversations in the run-up to the election. And thank you so much for the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce for hosting.